Welcome to tonight. Busy evening for you. Um, we have obviously a presentation behind me. It's a fairly rich item. The game plan this evening was that this is all about an overview to give you an insight into Prince2 Agile. It's an overview because the official launch date is the 24th of June. We're very lucky in the sense that combination of various contacts Axelos have given us inside track on this material. So this is the first event running in New Zealand. We did it last week in Auckland. We're now doing it in Wellington. Everything I show you tonight on screen tomorrow morning will be in your inbox. If you don't see it tomorrow morning, your filter has probably grabbed it. Contact us, we'll sort it out. Let's get into it. The aim is to give you an overview of what this new product, Prince2 Agile, is all about. Notice it's called an extension. It builds on Prince2. Help you understand where it fits in the context of the marketplace. Give you practical information about the product, the manual and availability. As I said, a copy of this presentation will be emailed to you as a PDF, as a download. So, a couple of acknowledgements. We're very lucky, say, both the Axelos people helped us out and we've had access to video material from the author, Keith Richards, not the rock star, of course. And, um, you know, our own material has been combined with the Axelos material for tonight. So, Prince 2, good governance. That hasn't gone away. The product is basically 10% Prince 2, 90% Agile. It's bringing together the governance strengths of Prince 2 with the flexibility at delivery level of Agile. And of course, everybody wants to be flexible, nimble. So hence, it's called an extension. It's not a replacement for Prince 2. It's got to be blended. It's not an either or scenario. So what's in it? Well, let's acknowledge the fact that Prince2 is fairly mature. The, latest, the current edition is 2009, dates back to 1996. If you choose to go down the certification route, you have to be current Prince2 practitioner. If you choose to do the course, there is a presumption you are familiar to a degree that's required with Prince2. It's not a course to teach you Prince2. Practical point, it's an additional certificate at practitioner only level. There's no foundation for those of you who are familiar with the foundation practitioner model. So 10% Prince 2, 90% Agile. The author, Keith Richards, the Canadian, uh, Lawrence Cooper, and there's about 40 odd advisors, collaborators, reviewers, one of whom is Scott, who put it all together. So, message that Axelos are pushing, it combines the governance strength of Prince 2 and the flexibility of Agile. But we're fortunate, we've got a few words now and a video which we'll switch to from the effectively product owner. Um, he kindly recorded this for New Zealand. Hello New Zealand and welcome to this preview event on Prince2 Agile, the new product from Axelos. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, before I go any further, let me just introduce myself. My name is Mike Acaster. I'm the PPM Portfolio Manager at Axelos. Prior to that, I was the PPM Portfolio Manager at the Cabinet Office and the Office of Government Commerce. I took responsibility for the PPM suite in 2007 and have led the developments ever since. What's included in the portfolio, I'm sure I don't need to tell you, but just as a reminder, it includes MSP, MOP, MOV, MOR, P3O, and P3M3. P3M3 is a bit unusual. It is not a certified qualification type product, but is a maturity model that helps organizations understand their performance. And of course, the big one in the family, Prince2. I was involved in the project to revise that in 2009. Just a little bit about Axelos, because it sometimes doesn't uh, translate outside of the UK. The Cabinet Office decided it could not really afford the investment in the products that were necessary to keep them at the forefront. So it went for a competitive tender exercise to bring in that investment. The successful candidate was Capita. Capita is an outsourced business service provider in the UK and is the government's go-to outsourcer in that regard. We fully came into operation on the 1st of January 2014. 
Since our inception, we've been looking at the portfolio and trying to understand what developments were necessary to maintain it at the forefront. A lot of the feedback that we've had on Prince 2 was that it didn't need to urgently change and that the core guidance could stay the same. However, there were elements that people thought needed to be covered and one of those big elements was Agile. So how can we cover it without putting it into the core guidance? The concept is a, an extension module, so this is aimed at people who already have a PRINCE2 qualification and will take them beyond that qualification and look at the application in the real world. And that's why we require candidates that already hold a PRINCE2 qualification, which we will take for granted and as the starting point for the training courses. So what is it and what are we going to cover in it? Well, there's about 10% PRINCE2, just as a recap for those that might have forgotten, and 90% of the new guidance is all around Agile approaches. How is it different to some of the other Agile approaches that you can see? Well, for one thing, this is not a single method and it's not a single approach. This looks at the interface and the blending that's necessary between PRINCE2 and all of the major Agile approaches. So it's going to look at things like Scrum, it's going to look at time boxing, it's going to look at iterative cycles and how you can cope with that within the plans. It's going to look at things like Kanban and how you can use some of that pull system mechanics within the planning environment. It's going to look at Lean Startup and trying to reduce the numbers of errors that you, you, that you incur. It's going to look at things like DSDM and XP and whilst it will cover some of the IT specifics, it doesn't major on them. And that's vital for us because we don't see this as being a product aimed solely at the IT market. This is a generic approach for project management combined with Agile that can be used in any industry. One of the things that you'll hear us talking about is the hexagon, which looks at tolerances, what you can fix, what you can flex. And it's very important to the product, along with Moscow and prioritisation through using that to identify the features that the product must have and linking it to the minimum marketable feature set or the minimum viable product, whichever you're using. It's also going to look at open communications and making sure that things like Kanban boards or big visible charts are used so that you can share the information openly and transparently. So that's a little bit about the product. When is it going to be ready? Well, we've put the manuscript into production and it's due for publication in the middle of June. We're also developing the exams and we've had the first train the trainer events where the exams have been successfully piloted and those are ready to roll out now to the examination institutes. We've also developed some base courseware to support ATOs delivering training and that again is being rolled out now through the ATO network. So by the middle of June everything should be published and available and this means that courses can start running from the end of June onwards. And I hope you're as excited as I am about this. I may not sound excited but I will certainly be relieved when this project's been delivered. But we've been overwhelmed by the response on a global scale. So I hope you'll get with the excitement. Let me wish you all the best for the rest of your meeting today. And thank you very much again for this opportunity to speak to you. So, overview of Agile. One of the issues about Agile as an idea is there's no one version of Agile. Often people talk about Agile ways of working. But there's no one version of Agile. There's one version of PMI, there's one version of PRINCE2 but there's no one version of Agile. If we look at the Agile Manifesto, dating back to 2001, that's probably the closest to the oversight. Notice the, the characteristics of it. It's not an either or, it's a yes and. And as you see it by the comments at the bottom there, there's value on the right, but we value these items more. Now, Agile itself came from a history focusing on the delivery of software. 
However, please note, Prince to Agile is not about IT projects. It's a general methodology. In the same way, Prince, 1980s, the original Prince, was for IT methodology. Prince 2, created in 96, was a general project management methodology. The point is, with Agile, what is it? It's the new black, isn't it? There's original Agile, perhaps, the software world, the dot-com boom, high quality, small caliber teams, co-located. A lot of organizations now talk about agility agile, as in flexible, nimble working practices. It's the nature of the globalization, the rate of change in the world. And lastly, which is our focus tonight, agile change delivery. So the project and program space. Prince to Agile very much focused on the third item, although you could arguably pick and choose elements from the manual to take into number two. But be careful, Agile is the new black. If you say Agile in organisations, everybody will have their own interpretation of what it really means. So, as I said a moment ago, there are many different areas of Agile. The original Agile manifesto came about from people who were frustrated with traditional ways of developing software. Some of you in the room are probably old enough to remember rapid application development in the 1990s. From that, we have effectively the emergence of Agile. And in hindsight, I didn't know it was Agile, but I did my first Agile project in 1998. It was an e-commerce delivery system. So be careful, as I said, which flavor of Agile are we talking about? Tonight, the focus is on change delivery. There's a universe out there of other Agile dimensions. There are a lot of good areas like XP, DSDM, Scrum, and others specifically, which can be used in the IT space. Visually, I guess this is a good way to summarize some of the key differences. So-called traditional waterfall style, a lot of upfront requirements analysis, it actually got the project manager, sorry, it actually got the um, sponsor or the client off the hook a lot of the time because you do requirements analysis, you get the client to sign it off, and then the client says, okay, project manager, you go away and do this. Come back in six months. If you succeed, I'll take the credit. If it doesn't, you're fired. One of the issues with Agile is you don't let the sponsor, the client, the business user, whatever the names you wish to use, off the hook. Because what we're looking for is, as the phrase there, Try saying that after a beer. Iterative and incremental development. A lot of frequent delivery into immediate use. Agile actually taps, I think, into another bugbear at the moment. Clients want more benefits earlier. Whether you say benefits realization, managing benefits, whatever phrase you use, people want payoff earlier. I think that's the big, bigger story, maybe, that's in the background with Agile. Now, Prince 2 Agile view of the world. As, as Mike said on the film, it's not really a specific single method per se. They've chosen this phrase, a family of behaviours, concepts, frameworks and techniques. If you like, it has Prince 2 through the middle as the backbone. Around of that, you've got a lot of other things. In some respects, for those of you who are PMI, it's actually a nod to the PMI view of the world with the body of knowledge. So you've got the Prince 2 method, remember, as the backbone, but then you've got this big toolbox of ideas in the manual and the method as well. So, the cake. On the left, Prince 2. Strengths in directing, managing, but very much at delivery level, that's when Agile comes in. So coming up from Agile, blending with project management, influencing how we direct, a blending of the two. It's not either or. Now, in fact, Prince 2 is completely compatible with Agile already. If you look five years plus ago, there were papers being written. And indeed, one of the reasons Keith Richards was chosen as lead author, his own heritage over the last 20 plus years combines both traditional waterfall, Prince 2, and Agile ideas anyway. He's authored several white papers on the subject. Prince 2 2009 is fit for purpose, which is why they didn't have to touch it when they chose to bring this extension product to market. But too often, let's be candid with you, Prince 2 sometimes is seen as bureaucratic, 
documentation heavy and slow. And that's more to do with the misuse of the method than any fundamental flaw with it. So let's unpack this. Within the manual, now tonight, with our time availability, I don't have time to go through the detail of all of this, so I'm going to be cherry-picking. Techniques largely is off-limits off tonight, because frankly there's far too much. Prince 2 in the centre provides the backbone. We've got Agile then wrapped around it. If you like, what we're trying to avoid is Fragile. Because too often many organisations like the idea of Agile, Senior management like the idea of on time, on budget, no contingency, never lay early benefits. They skip over the realities of, and it means, close intimate involvement with business users, clients and sponsors. What's the impact on my diary? No, you can't wait a week before you have a response to that. So they skip over the balance of the rights and responsibilities that Agile involves. So what we're trying to avoid is fragile. What we're trying to avoid, of course, also is the prejudice. You talk to agile people, waterfall people are slow, bureaucratic, two requirements dominated, always out of date because they can't handle change and indeed they're change resistant as far as change requests are concerned. As far as traditional project management people are concerned, agile people are fly by night, don't do documentation properly, don't think about maintenance, don't think about total life costs. Both sides are slightly correct, both sides are fundamentally wrong. And I think what the product does very neatly is draw upon the respective strengths, governance strengths of, Agile, uh, governance strengths of Prince 2 and the flexible delivery environment that Agile develops. Now Mike referred to the hexagon, i.e. focusing on the Prince 2 tolerances concept brought in in the 2009 edition. And in practical terms, this is how it plays out. Time and cost. One of the highly attractive elements of Agile is you fix them. You're never late with an Agile project. You're never over budget. I'll say that again. You're never late and you're never over budget. However, what you then have to do is rethink other elements. So on the left here, the argument is, because we're delivering frequently and early, we get payoff, i.e. benefits, more quickly. We have to think about the nature of uncertainty and risk. And so, the argument at the top, the first two we don't flex, the middle one, you fix and flex. You have, consideration, you have a debate about the considerations that matter, you flex, and then you're fixing them. The bottom here, and this is the real fundamental change, we debate and discuss what matters in scope. Effectively, we degrade the scope list. One of the problems with Agile, for example, from a procurement point of view, you're never quite sure 100% what you're going to get at the end. On the moment, we'll look at the Moscow technique, which is a form of prioritization. But in effect, we always have a view of what must we deliver, what should we deliver, and what could we deliver. <laughs> And we degrade the shoulds and could part of that list to ensure we always deliver the musts. Now that's a problem sometimes for clients because as far as the sponsor, the client, the business user wants, they want everything, don't they? And of course, in traditional waterfall style project management, that's why you spend so much effort on requirements analysis up front. And then you write it in blood, yes, you will get this. And the reality is, of course, over time, the danger is you go over cost, you go over time. And, of course, the danger is you start degrading quality criteria. Cut corners on testing, for example. Agile says, whatever you actually deliver meets specification. So, hence, fix and flex again. Scope is up for debate in terms of the precise detail of the end result. But whatever is actually delivered has to meet quality standards. If you like, it's a modern reinterpretation of the traditional time, cost, quality triangle, which again, contrary to many myths in Agile, is actually still valid now, isn't it? Because the flex area comes in the scope of what's actually to be delivered. So in summary, you, don't, you never flex time and cost. We have the upfront debate and conversation about what the precise targets are, but once you've effectively done the initial planning work, 
you fix time and cost. We have the conversation about what are the priorities in benefits areas, what are our priorities in risk. Now I shall be interested when I've gone through the manual in detail again to what extent it alludes to I think one critical success factor for Agile. And you could say this about any flavour of Agile. If the organisation's corporate strategy, business plan, enterprise architecture, whatever labels you want to use, if the upstairs thinking, dare I say, is fragile, then it actually makes it very difficult to do Agile projects because you need a reference point. And one of the reference points is, what's your organisation's attitude to risk? I should be very interested if anybody can point me in the direction of any case studies of agile project delivery in aerospace, nuclear, pharmaceuticals or any safety critical systems. One of the key points I think that Prince2 Agile touches on very well is it's yes and. It's got to be what's in your toolkit. There are some things, infrastructure, safety critical systems, aerospace maybe, where Agile will be contained, perhaps, at work stream level, work package level. There are some things that actually you need solid, traditional, waterfall ideas for. At the bottom there, quality criteria and scope. One of the things I'll touch on towards the end of the presentation is the impact on procurement and contracts. If time and cost is fixed, but you're not quite sure about scope, What's the impact, for example, with contracts with external suppliers? Procurement's playing catch-up at the moment, broadly speaking, with the agile world. Now, behind the hexagon are some of the East key ideas. Now, again, tonight, I'm only going to lightly touch on them in the time that we have available. Some of these I've spoken about already. Decide in your early planning about time targets, always promise to hit them. Whether that's at the lowest level time box, the middle level, the increments, or the final level, the project. Protect the level of quality. Once you've had a conversation about quality criteria, you will commit to deliver that, you will protect. So whatever is delivered will meet the quality criteria that you've specified. Embrace change. There's an argument that traditional project management ideas essentially are change resistant because that's why we put so much emphasis on change control procedures, configuration management. Philosophically, we don't really like having too much change. It disrupts the project manager. Agile flips that on its head. It says, in effect, let detail emerge during the life of the project. Put your outer framework in place, but like a jigsaw puzzle. And then the picture of the jigsaw puzzle, the detail will emerge. One of the phrases in the book is, once you've done your initial thinking, fix the, fix the breadth and allow the depth to emerge. Now, I think one of the practical challenges is the point about keep teams stable there. Let's remember where Agile has come from. The early days of Agile, dot-com boom, software development, we were talking high caliber, Relatively small teams, one of the classic phrases is seven plus or minus two. Co-located. Now let's jump forward to today. Part-time working, people working on multiple projects, location independent working out of the office. I'm sure we've all got smartphones, laptops, all that sort of good stuff. Perhaps across time zones. Former colleague of mine, my heritage includes being identity manager for Royal Mail. British Post Office, a former colleague of mine moved from Royal Mail to Barclays on their, their credit card division, coordinating teams in the UK, Estonia and India. Emphasis on agile working practices. Main challenge, none of the technology involved. It was all the people factors. So keeping teams stable, practical challenge. What about the use of video conferencing, audio conferencing, part-time working? There's a lot of the mechanics there that I think organisations will have to work through when they start to bring Agile on board. And lastly, you need actually very good diplomatic skills, except the customer doesn't need everything. However, let's put it politely that some technical people don't always have high people skills. So in terms of where Agile has come from, one of the challenges how do you negotiate and influence people in your business, user, client, community 
where they want everything. How do you get them to understand, like a five-year-old, that I want and I need, wants, needs, desires? That's a difficult conversation. So we've mentioned Moscow prioritization. Agile people claim this is one of their own, but actually it's been around a long time before that. Must-haves. Don't deliver this project failure, period. Should-haves. Don't deliver those. A lot of inconvenience, but you can work around it. Must-haves. Don't deliver that minor inconvenience. But like the conversation around wants, needs and desires, requires tact and diplomacy. And agile people emphasize you apply this at every single level. You know, you're always Moscowing everything from project level, increment level, time box level. Because the argument is value comes about from delivery. There's no point being perfect and late. It's variation, if you like, the phrase 80-20 rule Pareto principle. Easy to talk about Moscow, in practice very difficult to do. Now, one of the more challenging aspects of the new method is this, Kenevin. It's actually a Welsh phrase from Dave Snowden, former IBMer. And essentially, it's a way of characterising how we approach things. So, things are very obvious. Maybe that's the business as usual world. We can apply good practice methods. We know what we're doing in that space. It's fairly ordered. Perhaps we're talking about complicated areas. Again, there's a degree of predictability in this. Again, we can look at maybe either good practice or emerging practice. Complex. We're pushing boundaries here. We may have to invent new ways of working. And lastly, the chaotic area, where we're talking perhaps cutting-edge innovation. I think it plays well to the idea of what's in your toolkit. Are we using full-on agile? Do we actually need to go back to traditional waterfall methods? Are we looking for a hybrid? And the last domain being in the middle, disorder. So quite a lot in this and exploring as a key reference point. Essentially, I think it's there for one simple reason. Management is evolving over the last 20 or 30 odd years. If we look at the heritage of where management came from, it came about in the Industrial Revolution to run factories. Highly predictable scenarios. Stuff came into the beginning of the factory. You had a largely low education workforce in the factory. They had to be controlled and managed, command and control. And coming out of the factory, you had products. Jump forward to today, you've got variously called the knowledge economy, service economy, information economy. Life is far more complicated. Command and control, less and less relevant. And agile is one manifestation of how management is changing. So if you Google Kenevin, you'll find there's various resources. Dave Snowden now has his own firm, some useful videos up there. Um, we'll certainly be exploring that a lot during the uh, Prince to Agile framework. So in summary, it's about choosing which of the domains that my particular project is going to operate in. If it's in the obvious domain, actually, is it really a project? Maybe it's business as usual. Project stuff largely applies to the complicated, complex, or chaotic domain. What this relates to, the bottom here, is how do I relate to corporate governance? How do I run my organization? How does it impact on operations, government, business as you? How does it relate to how I do project management? Kenevin is quite a powerful concept, in effect, guiding you through your toolkit. As I said, do I need full-on waterfall? Do I need full-on agile? Do I need a hybrid? Do I actually say to the business manager who wants me to run this, no, excuse me, that should be done in business as usual. We don't need to projectize this. There's too much overhead involved. Because one thing that organizations can do if they're not careful is make too many things projects. BAU needs to take responsibility. 
Now, Agile emphasizes early delivery of value, early delivery of benefits. And of course, it presupposes your organization has a clear understanding of what is value to that organization, or what do you value. Value comes from values. So in your organization, where are management priorities? One of the classic mistakes in the center here is confusing delivery of stuff with value. Yeah, those of you who've done MSP will know this chain. Projects deliver outputs, which give you capabilities. Capabilities let you exploit and achieve outcomes. Outcomes are measured by benefits. Agile, in some respects, is more in the program mindset space than the project mindset space. Because Agile is emphasizing all the time the delivery of benefits, the achievement of value. There is an argument there's a lovely quote on New Zealand Treasury in one of their publications that projects represent bounded change, programs represent unbounded change. And in some respects, therefore, Agile is more akin to the program management philosophy. And not every project manager makes a good program manager. Many years ago, when I did my own MSP program credential in the UK, I was fortunate the guy running it was a very good, experienced project and program consultant. We had three Ministry of Defence project managers on our course. Charles took me aside during the coffee break one morning and said, David, those guys are going to fail. And he was right, they did. They were very good project managers, but they thought railway tracks. They thought linear. It was, I know what the problem is, I know what the solution should be, I know how to get there. Appropriate, given we're by the sea here, program management is more like sailing. I want to sail across to Picton. I've got to deal with the currents, the tides, the winds, especially the winds in Wellington. It's not a straight journey. Not every project manager makes the leap to program manager. I would suggest not every waterfall project manager will naturally feel comfortable in the agile space. That's not a criticism. It's simply recognizing your own working style the style of organization you're in and the type of projects you're involved with. I like the fact the manual puts a lot of emphasis on effectively the toolbox concept, which is why I said earlier, I think this is perhaps a nod towards the body of knowledge idea that PMI talks about. So Agile actually says change a good thing in the sense of we can't always know at the, de at the beginning the detail that we need at the end. So change is emergent. You could argue that traditional project management methods are much more about predictive management. We need to do the requirements analysis, predict what's required, and then just get on and do it. In contrast, Agile way of working says, fix your breath at the beginning, but let the change, let the detail emerge during the journey. Now, principles and behaviours. Agile has a set of principles in the same way that Prince2 has. Agile, Prince2 Agile also picks up five behaviours to be monitored. Now, what's on the slide, I suggest, no surprises. Perhaps it's more about the interpretation and the slant that's put upon them. Certainly, any traditional project manager couldn't disagree with what's on the slide. But transparency, for example, visibility. Traditional Agile teams, co-located, whiteboards, big displays, complete transparency, open book. I was with a large New Zealand software house recently up in Auckland. Such things as open book accounting with your clients. Transparency of staff allocations, invoicing, all that sort of stuff. This is where we start to push at some of the practical behavioral realities as you go into the Agile world. And senior management on both sides, supplier and client, may like what they hear about Agile, on time, on budget delivery, never late. But then you get into the practical realities of behaviours. Um, Self-organisation, big idea in the Agile world. Have any of you here ever had a situation where your team leader is elected by the team? That's the pure Agile view of how the team, self-empowered teams operate. 
large corporations, whether they're private sector or government ministries? Would self-electing teams work in large bureaucracies, I wonder? I don't know whether they trademarked it yet. They probably will. Agileometer. This essentially is a, a health check tool. And notice the last remark. It's always about how much rather than yes or no. Each of the sliders should be used individually. So item one. Is there actually really flexibility in what isn't being delivered? I've had conversations recently in New Zealand. If you're doing infrastructure projects, can you sort of half build a network or half build a railway? Those of you who visit Auckland City Link, can we sort of build one railway track instead of two? Agile is not suitable for everything. Um, last point here: acceptance of agile. Is there general, sorry, genuine cultural acceptance of? Agile ways of working, the implications of Agile. And there's various other questions. So each of the sliders, as I said, used individually. It's about, if you like, giving you a temperature. It's about giving you a sense of, should we do Agile? Don't jump into it. Do Agile prototype projects. Use Agile to learn Agile, in effect. So let's just remind us that quality is defined by quality criteria. Whatever we deliver will meet standard. Where we vary is scope, and scope is defined by the products, the things that you actually deliver. We need to keep them separate. The trouble is, of course, your average sponsor, end user, client, etc., will co conflate those nicely together. And what, if you don't deliver everything in terms of their wants, needs, and desires, they could interpret that, of course, as poor quality project management. But they're different. Now, I mentioned earlier procurement, which I think will prove to be one of the practical challenges for government departments, large corporations, and others as they start to embrace Agile. Because if you don't know precisely what you're being delivered at the end, Moscow style, how do you frame the contract? Now, you'll hear phrases like, well, there's a funding envelope. And within that, we've got a Moscow prioritization of features or elements to be delivered. But I suggest this is one of the practical challenges. In the video, you heard Mike talk about minimum viable product, i.e., what are all the musts? be clear what the minimum version of good looks like. And of course, you can't really understand what the minimum version of good looks like if you don't have a good corporate strategy, business plan, whatever the architecture upstairs is. So in some respects, the danger with Agile is it throws a magnifying glass on the organisation. If there's incoherent, ill-thought-through thinking at the moment, Agile is in danger of being the messenger that gets shot. I know of one large organisation that chose to go down this pathway, spent two or three hundred pounds and two, two to three hundred thousand pounds sterling, a bit of a disaster. To the extent in that particular company you can no longer say the A word. Now they need flexible, nimble working practices. They need modular approaches. You just cannot use the A word anymore. So, start to pull this all together. It's important you understand what are you trying to achieve. In particular, for example, what does good look like? Is it the success of the payoff, the business case? Is it the success of how you do project delivery? I mentioned I have a background in identity management. I recall a survey story in the UK Design Week magazine, talking to different clients and agencies. There's one lovely quote. So an anonymous client talking about a particular project said, we're really happy with the results. It's been highly successful for us in the marketplace and we'll never work with the design consultancy again. Because frankly, it's such a torturous process working with them. So they loved the end result, but the working process killed the relationship. Or number three there, 
To what extent do we judge that agile ways of working have been embedded and taken on board? You need to have a view of what good looks like. Different stakeholders in your organisations will be concerned with different elements of that. And of course, apply traditional disciplines. There should be a business case as to why we're investing in agile. So in summary, the argument is that Prince2 combined with Agile gives you the best of both worlds. It gives you a good governance framework with much more flexibility at the delivery level for earlier on-time, on-budget delivery. Those of you who are already committed to using Prince2, it's an extension route you don't have to reinvent, is the argument. It's about knowing your toolbox, however, and appreciating some things are better suited to traditional waterfall and understanding what works in your own organisation. So hence this point here, it's always how much rather than either or. Now a few practical points. I had an email yesterday, Axelos have now confirmed June 24th as the formal global launch date. So. Notice, Prince2 Agile is not a Prince2 revision course. If you go down the pathway of training and certification, there is a presumption, and we will be, be ourselves being careful about how we do course instructions and pre-reading. We won't have time to teach you Prince2 on a course. You've got to have your Prince2 practitioner, so you can go straight then to the Agile version. If you're foundation, you'll need to do your practitioner standard two-day upgrade as previously, then you can go into Agile. Now, some of you may well be PMI. New Zealand is a strong market for that. If you're not aware, last year, Axelos changed their criteria. If you have your PMI, either PMP, the top tier, or the one slightly below it, CAPM, that gives you a pass on foundation exams. You can go straight to Prince2 Practitioner. Practical suggestion, if you take that route, you've got to do decent pre-reading and homework because on a Prince2 practitioner course, there is a presumption you know the basics of Prince2. But it does give you a pass straight to Prince2 practitioner level, which means you can do Prince2 practitioner and then straight to Agile. Um, those of you from the UK, Europe scenario, Institute the International Project Management Association is the global federation of national bodies. So APM is the UK, obviously IPM is the Australian one. Like PMI, that gives you a pass on your Prince2 foundation. So Axelos are trying to flex their routes to credentials to reflect prior experience, prior learning, prior credentials. So the actual course, when it's offered, and we anticipate early mid-July, we're just being slightly cautious at the moment until we physically have the exams and manual in our hand. It'll be a three-day course with a two-and-a-half-hour standard practitioner-style exam. If you are a Prince2 practitioner, you have to be current. Remember, there's two flavours of practitioner. There's Prince2 practitioner, I plast it, but there's also, am I a registered Prince2 practitioner in the current five-year domain? So if you're six years ago since you did your Prince2 practitioner, your registered status has lapsed. And currently, as we understand Axelos's guidance, they will require that you are a registered Prince2 practitioner, i.e. you've done it in the last five years. We're planning now for maybe a 20-minute or so q and um, I'm fortunate because I have one of the reviewers here i.e. anything difficult, it's heading in his direction. Um, Nolene, you had a question. Just on credentialing, you have a requirement that um, your Prince2 practitioner is current um, and you have currency every five years. So do you anticipate that this will also have a currency of five years, the agile? That's what we anticipate. We're waiting for the definitive statement from Axelos. I'm sorry. The question was, currently, registered practitioner status for Prince2 is a five-year timeline. What will be the status of 
Prince to Agile extension as a practitioner status. We haven't had a definitive ruling, but we anticipate it will be exactly the same. And indeed, Axelos have indicated they will publish guidelines to help candidates synchronise their dates. Because obviously, from an Axelos point of view, they're trying to balance, promote the product, but also minimise the hassle factor for individuals and client companies as well. So, subject to confirmation, we anticipate, yes, it will be a five-year registration timeline, and there will be an announcement on helping you align renewal dates. Can I add something to that as well? So, the thing is, you see, in New Zealand, for a time, practitioner certificates did not have an expiry date. And it was only introduced around about, I don't know, 2009 or something like that. So, have a look and check to see if your certificate has an expiry date. You might be able to get away with it. <laughs> but I want you to buy, of course, of course, but never mind. <laughs> it might help you. Um, MSP is incredibly useful. Repeat. Doesn't sorry. If you've got MSP practitioner, does that have value? Well, it afraid doesn't give you a pass straight into Prince Two Agile. You've got to have your Prince Two Agile. Sorry, you've got to have your Prince Two practitioner certificate. I would say exposure to MSP will be incredibly useful to people doing the Agile credential, <coughs> but you still need to have your Prince 2 practitioner. There's a practical point here. We won't be able to register you for the exam unless the Examination Institute can tie up and say, yep, this person has a Prince 2 practitioner certificate. Does that address your point? Yeah, so I had a practitioner, but obviously that's expired six years ago. So how long does it take to renew that? What's involved in so that's Prince 2 practitioner renewal, yep. it, we run a two-day module. It's the latter part of a standard Prince 2 course. Um, in regards to, you know, we've got a lot of government departments here. How do we know we're investing in the right course? And how do we know what kind of feedback we can get? Okay, I'd ask, I think the question that needs to be asked is, does my government department need to embrace agile ways of working? If the answer is yes, the next question is, so what flavour of Agile? There are different flavours of Agile in the marketplace. The argument in favour of the Axelos product is that it's seamlessly integrated with the Prince2 framework. So, of course, another question is, as a government department, is Prince2 our de facto or official way of working to run projects? Again, if the answer is yes, this flavour of Agile would be easier to adopt than the other flavours of Agile in the marketplace. Does that help with your point? Yeah, I think it's just very early days. And it's exciting. Yeah. It is exciting, but um, it's just like... <laughs> well, let me give you a, a practical consideration. Keith Richards, the author, has been involved in Prince2 project management Agile for the best part of 20 odd years. If I were to unpack the manual, with the possible exception of the Kinevin framework, which I think is a new addition here, almost everything I've read in the framework, I can find in other Agile methods anyway. Effectively, Keith Richards has acted like a chef. He's assembled a whole set of existing agreements in a coherent framework, bearing in mind behind him there were 40 odd practitioners, advisors, consultants who've contributed to this. So in that sense, what Axelos is trying to do is de-risk the decision of any organisation that A, wants to go down the Agile route, B, is choosing this particular product. Um, I'm trying to remember the phrase in the manual. I think it was corporate friendly is the phrase that they've used in the manual. Because there's a lot of talk about Agile generally in the marketplace, and senior management like what they're hearing in terms of on time, on budget delivery, never late, no contingencies required. But then there's a hesitancy and, and yeah, okay, but which version of Agile and what exactly does Agile mean? Axelos, let's be quite clear, are trying to de-risk that conversation. They want to be corporate friendly. So that, I guess, is, is a summary of the sort of sales pitch that Axelos would argue for this particular product. Does that help? Any other? Prince 2 um, defines roles and responsibilities. Yep. Um, and 
So I'm in a, an agile world, as it working in the organisation I'm in. And their view is that project management don't really, well, project managers don't need to exist because you've got Scrum Master. Yep. How does that align with? So roles and responsibilities in the product, they are there. Scrum, well established, and there's a lot of Scrum alluded to and used in this particular product. Scrum is a well established agile product framework. Scrum is not for project management. Scrum is a delivery level. So in the PRINCE2 model of directing, managing, delivering, Scrum exists at the delivery level. Remember, this is about an agile project management framework. A lawful lot of agile has come from business as usual, product backlog delivery. Business as usual, just get through the product backlog in the software world. What Agile's project management is doing, and this product and other flavours of it, is saying how can we use Agile ideas but perhaps good governance, including the managing level and the directing level. Part of Keith's background, he was formerly technical director of the not-for-profit consortium DSDM. They're one of the big players in the Agile space. So he's brought that view to the table as well. Does that help with your question? Does it? Reinforces my point. It's been working to the team. Dave, just a question. Um, and to the detail. So um, with regard to product descriptions or use of product descriptions, you are integrating or linking them to the product backlog if you're using Scrum, mm -hmm. for example. Is that, uh, so, sorry, concept, so concept of product descriptions. They're in prints too. Relevance to Agile, well, yes, we need some degree of documentation. Do we need all the documentation that Prince2 necessarily advocates? If you recall in Prince2, we've got the top level product description. Well, effectively, we can repurpose that now as describing what are our musts, what potentially are the shoulds and the coulds. Let's be quite clear. It's a myth that you don't need paperwork in Agile. That's one of the criticisms from traditional project management people. It's just that if we're doing things on an iterative incremental basis, one, of the, one idea to think about is it's effectively rolling planning. It's just-in-time planning. One of the criticisms, perhaps, of a very formal, traditional use of PRINCE2 is all that requirements and upfront work we did in starting up a project process and initiating a project process got overtaken by events. So I've got to do a whole load of new paperwork again, redo stuff, redo stuff, redo stuff. Agile is trying to square the circle, so to speak, by saying, do relevant documentation as far as we need to do it. And then, on a rolling basis, let change emerge. So we still need product description, in effect, but in a different form and to a different level of detail. Does that address your point? Yeah, no, that's good. Thank you. Um, gentleman there. You obviously need to be very familiar with Prince too. How much familiarity is expected in Agile concepts? How much familiarity do you need with Agile concepts? P familiarity with Prince 2 is a given. I'd answer the question in two ways. Certainly any familiarity with Scrum or any other things like XP, DSDM will certainly be valuable to you. Is it a requirement? No. One of the things we're reviewing at the moment is what sort of pre-course reading guidance do we give? It's going to be a pretty full-on. One of the points that Keith Richard made in the briefing video to people like us is the first morning is a reality check for delegates. It's a fairly full-on first half, for, you know, first day, first half. Um, but as I say, I think we're, we're still evaluating how much help we give to delegates but it's not a requirement to have any Agile background. Fortunately, with the odd exception like Kinevin, there's very little from an Agile perspective in this product that you would not already see out there if you did a Google search, if you looked at any of things like DSDM, Safe, XP, Lean, any of these Agile flavours that are out there in the market already. Does that help with your point? Uh, there's another question here. I was just going to ask, given that we're talking about Agile having the same objectives as um, programs, are we expecting MSP Agile? I don't know about Axelos's opinion. I do know that DSDM have launched Agile program management in the UK. 
because I'm very concerned in, in the government space in New Zealand that um, the maturity of senior managers and their interpretation of what their input is to an agile process will actually lead to a rapid devaluation of this brand. I think you're right. My personal opinion, having reviewed the agile program management stuff in the UK, I think it's unnecessary because I think MSP is fit for purpose. Unfortunately, let's be blunt, Agile is a sexy brand name. Why do you think they've called it Prince 2 Agile Extension? Agile is the new black. My own view is I'd rather stick with my project management toolbox, PMI, Prince 2, etc., and Agile, and then I'll have my MSP toolbox over here, which is forgotten is it fourth or fifth generation now Scott it's not, since 1999 MSP is very robust very adaptable as a framework but I think you highlight a real danger that anything can become flavor of the moment and end up being devalued whether in the past it was business process re-engineering total quality management you name the fads of the last 20 odd years to pick up perhaps on your point earlier, if you've got any kind of background exposure to MSP, that's a bonus item if you get into the Agile space. A bonus item, not a requirement. Does that help with your point? Thanks for the presentation, Tim. It's been really useful. And it's my question is perhaps a follow-on, which is one of the biggest okay, criticisms of project management and government in New Zealand is poor government. Yes. Personal opinion, I think that organisations that go down this pathway are in for an uncomfortable ride because I think it will act as a magnifying glass. If you have good governance, if you have a good enterprise architecture, if you have a good corporate strategy, business strategy, whatever name you wish to use, it's well thought through and understood and properly communicated, you have nothing to fear. If you add a negative to anything I've just said, this will simply amplify. I'll just finish this oh, last point. Those of you, those, serious point, those of you from an IT background will know, of course, and be hurt by the phrase garbage in, garbage out. I think agile is high caliber management when it's done well. And therefore, if you have any cracks in your current governance system, this will amplify. Let me conclude with the following summary. People like me, if I ask around the marketplace what are clients talking about, what are consultants talking about, what are contractors focusing their careers on, three very important things come over time and time again. We need to get better at the investments we're making, portfolio management. We need to get better at getting payoff, benefits management. We need to get better at how we wrap all that up in governance level. I think at the Agile space, whether it's the Axelos product or others, touch on early delivery of benefits. Because there's a focus on value, arguably it's touching on and contributing to better portfolio conversations. And the strength of something like Axelos's product is it's strengthening an approach to governance. But nothing can avoid the problem that once you hit a glass ceiling of senior management, the sort of people who sit on your project and program boards, your investment committees, if they're not of high caliber, it doesn't matter which product we're talking about, you still have an issue to deal with. So it can either amplify your successes or amplify your troubles. This is how I would conclude. We have Graham's credit card waiting for us. <laughs> Thank you for your time and efforts. As I said, if you wish to join us downstairs, we'd be delighted to see you. You will be getting a copy, remember, of this presentation in your inbox. Thank you for your time. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone, for giving up your time tonight. And as David said, if you want to come down and drink, we'd be very happy to see you.